everybody. I hope you had a wonderful lunch and you're fed, but hopefully not fed up because we've got a whole other lineup of sessions. And this next one is starting with the workplace. And I think we can bring the music down as well. Some data for you to know about the workplace. In G7 countries, including here in the United States, there are 12.5% more men participating in the labor market than women. And when women are employed, they're less likely to be full-time, more likely to be part-time workers than their male counterparts. And then that's not even talking about access to child care and unconscious bias. So I won't belabor the point because our panel is going to dive into all of this. So I want to welcome the moderator, Shelley Poor. Porges, co-founder and managing partner of Beyond the Billion, and her powerhouse panel. Let's give them a round of applause. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed the lunch as much as we all did. We had a little coffee clutch, lunch of <laughs> for this. Uh, we had prepared before, of course. Um, I am very excited to be here today to speak about and to get our amazing panelists to talk about a very important issue. to speak into all of us. Oh, excuse me. I'm so <laughs> not used to this. <gasps> Let me repeat. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. This is going to be the most fun panel. No. Uh, and uh, especially if we speak into the microphones. Um, I'm very excited, actually, sincerely, to be here with these amazing leaders who have such great insights from each of their very different and interesting experiences in the workplace. But before I get started and introduce you to each of them, let me ask you a question. How many of you have had an experience at all, at any time in your career, with gender bias? Okay, guys, are you, you're allowed to raise your hand, too, if you've had it, if you've experienced it, I mean. And um, how many of you, uh, and I'm not speaking now about your current employer, where you are working now, but how many of you have ever left a job because of gender bias? And then, uh, again, not necessarily speaking about your current employer, so just to be clear, uh, I'm not trying to out anybody here, uh, but how many of you have actually left a job in, say, the last two to three years because of gender bias? Okay, a few of you, including a gentleman up there. Okay. Well, interestingly, in 2022, McKinsey did their annual, they've been doing it for seven years now, their annual uh, Women in the Workplace report. And what they talked about was many things. But one of the great things, they, one of the things they talked about that really struck me and very, I think, apropos of this panel is what they called the great breakup. Interestingly, women at the director level I know many of you are above the director level, but women at the director level uh, get promoted. For every one woman at the director level who gets promoted, two leave the company. So just imagine you're the head of that company or the head of the department or the head of the region, whatever you know, part of the organization you lead, and two people are leaving for every one person who you're promoting. What would that do to your organization? This is, this is the world we live in right now, and for all, so many different reasons that we'll be discussing, I think, today. So with that in mind, let me introduce you to the great panel. First of all, Anne-Marie Slaughter. Some of you may know her because she wrote an article uh, sometime in 2012, was it? Uh, over a decade. That, over a decade ago that um, was one of the most read articles ever, certainly for the Atlantic magazine where it was published, about whether women can have it all. Can we have it all? Let's, let's hear. We'll hear in a minute. Um, since then, though, I want to let you know, uh, Anne-Marie, in addition to you know, uh, writing the article, of course, is the um, CEO of New America. And she's also a professor at Princeton University, the 66 Univer uh, Berg G. Kerstetter, 66 University Professor Emerita of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University, where she lives. Um, from 2009 to 2011, importantly, um, she served as the Director of Policy Planning for the United States, for the United States State Department. And she was the first woman in that role. And that's actually, yeah, that's where we met. Um, next to Anne-Marie uh, Anne is uh, Michelle. Uh, Michelle Meyer Shipp. 
is the CEO for Dress for Success Worldwide, the leading global nonprofit employment resource for women. Michelle leads the organization's 140 affiliates in 24 countries as it continues its mission to help women achieve economic independence. I thought it was interesting, too, that in Michelle's background, she joined, she joined Just for Success from Major League Baseball. How many of you are baseball fans here? Um, and uh, there, she served as the chief people and culture officer. And while at MLB, Michelle led the Human Resources Diversity and Inclusion Initiative, among other things that she did. So welcome, Michelle. And last but certainly not least, someone I've enjoyed meeting recently, getting to know a little bit in the last week since we've all been introduced to each other, is Sue Lynn Watson from Standard Chartered Bank. Excuse the ruffling. Um, Sue Lynn is the managing director at, at uh, Standard Chartered. She is uh, and a senior banker uh, based in New York. Standard Chartered, you may or may not know, Standard Chartered Bank is a leading international bank with a 160-year history and a unique global footprint across 60, 59 countries, 59 markets. So welcome. In her role as senior banker, I thought this was interesting, Sulin acts as the global relationship manager for portfolio of the bank's largest US headquartered multinational clients. So she's got a very, I think we, each, we have women here with very different perspectives, very different experiences, and I'm really excited to jump into the conversation. So Anne-Marie, you wrote the article. It changed the world, I really think it did. <laughs> well, seriously, because we were all experiencing it, and nobody was talking about it, really. Uh, and you made us talk about it. And when you start talking about it, you know, you can't do but, you know, start addressing it. You know, it's the kind of the wor things that were unsaid. And with such success that you had had already at that point in your career, for you to be saying that was huge. So please, would you tell us, tell us a little bit in short, you know, what the article was about, why you wrote it, and as importantly, has anything changed? Yeah. Um, so thank you. First of all, it's great to see all of you, and it's great to see the thousands of you that I'm going to assume are watching us online. <laughs> uh, you know, I wrote that article thinking a relatively small number of Atlantic readers would read it, uh, that, uh, yes, I, I was not, I was a foreign policy expert, I'd never written on gender before, uh, but that it, it really had been an epiphany for me to get to the State Department, to have a great job, to have a great boss, to have everything right. I had a supportive husband, I had all, the, all that you could need. And I ended up making a choice I never expected that I'd make, which was in favor of my family. I left after two years. And that led me then to say, you know, I've been telling women forever, of course you can have it all. You just have to work hard enough. You just have to be organized enough. You just have to read the 25,000 books on time management and squeeze, you know, an extra two minutes out of your day. And it was for me a no. You know, it doesn't matter what you do. Life happens and we need to change the system. And of course, I was not the first person to write that article. Somebody wrote that article in 1982, 1992, 2002, uh, but it did hit a generational moment where uh, you know, there were old women of my generation who were furious at me for writing it, but whose daughters liked it, and there were women of my generation who agreed and whose daughters didn't like it. So there was, and there were huge debates among couples. All these men kept coming up to me going, oh yeah, that article, <laughs> you know, my wife gave it to me. Pause. Which then meant, and we had a huge fight. <laughs> so, but so, um, I think a lot has changed. One, at the, mo at the time it was all Henry Slaughter versus Sheryl Sandberg, and I am still introduced as the woman who thinks women can't have it all, and that was not the point at all. The point was, we have to make major structural change, and I now never use the phrase have it all. I've written about, let's just get rid of this forever. It is a entitled, obnoxious phrase that was uh, developed by Her Helen Gurley Brown for Cosmo, so it's not part of anybody's sort of feminist creed. Um, but I think now people understand it's both and. Of course you have to lean in. Of course you sit at the table. Of course you raise your hand. We all mentor women uh, to do those things. But when 
you know, the fact that only one in three women who, you know, all those women who graduate from all those schools and they don't make it to the top, that's not because they didn't lean in. Maybe occasionally, but it's really because the system is not set up for women, but it's really not set up for caregivers. So that's one thing I think has changed. It's both. Second, I wrote that, I didn't know. I'd never studied women's studies. I wrote that as a very privileged white feminist, right? My feminism was, to the extent I knew it, was Gloria Steinem and Brett, Betty Friedan, and I got on the speaking circuit and wandered around and talked about us. And I, of course, had many African-American or Latino women raising their hands and saying, you know, that wasn't my family's story. And I think we are far more conscious now of feminisms uh, and the ways in which the experience of many different women in the United States, but also around the world, we, we the people who shaped that that narrative, who really were, you know, Betty Friedan was a white suburban housewife uh, who was bored and well-educated, and that was a very important movement, but it's a movement. So I think that's different. I think the, I think being aware of men needing, to, you know, that we need a double revolution. You can't have a women's revolution without having a men's revolution. You can't expect women to do all the men, men, the work that men traditionally did, and not expect men to do the women, the work that women traditionally did. We're not there yet, but at least there's a far greater awareness among younger men, and I include my own sons, both of whom are basically advertising to be lead parent husbands. So if you have daughters who have good incomes, do come see. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and I'm only half joking. Um, the other thing, I, the biggest change through the pandemic, many of us have begged bosses for years to let us work more flexibly, to say, of course I can get it done at home, and it was presence over performance. Well, the pandemic blew that out of the water, right? We were all at home, and people, in fact, my organization, people were more productive. If by productive, you mean they got the writing done. They were less productive in terms of building social capital and, and sort of workplace culture. But, but So that's really dramatically changed. Now we're fighting with what's the right blend of hybrid work, and we can talk about that. But the biggest change, and the last one, is, so I wrote that article in 2012. I wrote a book in 2015 called Unfinished Business, which far fewer people read, but I changed my thinking dramatically between those two things because the book is about really what we have to do is to value care. Right? If you'd asked me in 2012 about my mother, I'd have said she was she's a professional artist. She's fabulous. I would not have said she spent the first 20 years of my life nurturing her family. And without that family, I don't, nothing that I have achieved would exist. I mean, that family is my rock and my foundation. And I didn't value that work. And certainly, I think my generation of feminists were taught not to talk about children, not to talk about family. Going forward, we need an entire infrastructure of care. And when people work in care, paid, we need to pay them much more. Unpaid, we need to value them much more. It's not a blank space on your resume. That work is just as important as paid work. And so that, now, I, you know, Biden has a care infrastructure. We're talking about care. People like Ai Jen Poo have done a huge amount to raise the importance of care workers. But that's the next revolution, I think, is that a world that really says, you know, the work of care is just as important as the work of competition. So I'll stop there. Thank you. That's phenomenal. Thank you. Michelle. Yes. Um, you advise, your organization uh, advises women all over the world, as I understand it, uh, on workplace issues. Where, where do, what are women saying around the world and what are they facing? And, and importantly, what are some of the solutions that you've gotten excited about that you've seen because you see such different workplaces? Yeah, thank Sorry. you for that. And, and like Anne Marie said, I just want to say thank you for having me. I'm really honored to be here and happy to have this conversation. Um, let me just level set by telling you a little bit about who the women are that I'm dealing with and talking to every day. So the women that we serve, um, they they are all around 24 countries. We have 144 chapters in, in 24 countries. And the women range in age between the 18-year-old non-college-bound high school young woman 
all the way to 60 plus and everywhere in between. She is unemployed, she is underemployed. Um, in some instances, she is returning to work after taking time off to care for and raise her children, or she's returning to work after a layoff, or she's returning to work after having lost her job during the pandemic. And then we have the women, like some of the women, the, the courageous, amazing women we've heard from today who are survivors of all sorts of tragedies and unfortunate situations. Situations. So these are the women that we're talking to. About 50% of them live below the poverty level, but the other 50% are professionals with experience in their careers. So it's a very interesting blend. But one of the common themes really is around what you just said, Anne Marie. We're hearing consistent themes around the need for flexibility and the need for support with childcare. Um, and it's actually fascinating because before I took this role, I never really appreciated the childcare plight because I think anybody sitting in this room is probably comfortable enough to be able to afford childcare. And in my case, I have three young adult sons, so I lived an au pair life for a decade, okay? And so I never had to think about it. Now I'm talking to women who can barely make ends meet. They're not necessarily making a livable wage, and so the last thing they can do is pay for childcare. So- If it's even available. If it's e Exactly, if it's even available. And to that point, one of the stats I just saw um, spoke to the fact that as we've come around the corner on the pandemic, knock wood, hopefully, um, the number of child care providers is significantly reduced from what it was pre-pandemic. So women are struggling. Um, domestically in the U.S., it's a big issue, but it's also an issue around the world. And several women in other countries have told us that it's not so much an issue of child care per se, but it's an issue around the cultural expectations of their family members about what's supposed to happen once they have a child. You're supposed to be here, or you're supposed to take care of the children and your, your parents and in-laws. So they're really looking for ways to have our organization help them kind of get enough courage to speak up and, and kind of push back against the system. Mm -hmm. um, they're looking for help and resources to get out into the workplace, and we're trying to help them navigate all of that in a myriad of ways. Wow. So can you give us a couple of examples of how you do that? I mean, it sounds overwhelming. It sounds almost impossible. So we. So I'll say this. First of all, we meet every woman where she's at, and every woman has a different story. I mean, I could sit here and tell you stories for hours, and they're just incredible stories of transformation. Um, but we actually had one woman, and we were recently, she told her story on a, on a TV show we were on recently, and she lost her house. She had a daycare center. She lost her in-home daycare center with um, Hurricane Sandy. Um, single mom, lost everything, no income, out of work. She came to us and we helped her find temporary childcare for her own children for free. We helped her literally with new clothing for herself and gave her resources to get her children clothing. We helped her find temporary housing and then we actually helped her rebuild a resume because she hadn't had one in quite a long time. She'd been in childcare in her own home business for a decade. We helped her create a resume, prepare for interviews and go out and seek employment. So now she is working. She is thriving, her kids have grown up, and she now is literally on the path of starting her own business anew, now that her kids have grown up and got on their feet. And she's just one of the many success stories. So I'm just honored to see the courage and the resilience of these women who are coming to us to tap into these resources. Thank you. Thanks for that. It's amazing. And where do you get your resources from? Because that, that, that takes a, I mean, I'm just listening to no, all the different things you did that, and knowing that care workers are leaving and, and, and you know, some of your... I'm glad, oh, you, I'm glad you asked that because here's, here's, these are the things, this is something that keeps me up at night. Um, what keeps me up at night is all of our resources that we offer are free. There are no fee services. We are funded primarily 90% from corporate giving corporate partnerships. And what's really cool about it is in addition to corporations funding us with financial support, they actually give us employee engagement volunteerism. So it's, I mean, we have, so for example, we have one financial institution that does all of our financial literacy training, like everything from managing a checkbook to building your retirement planning. They actually come in and do this training for our women. They do it online, they do it in some of our you know, career centers, and this has been going on for years. 
And how do you deliver that globally? Because that's the other challenge yes. here, right? So we actually have an online platform, um, and we use the online platform as one of the ways. But one of the other things we do is, with these partners, we kind of toolkit things, and then we deploy them at the local level. And you train the trainer and things of that nature. And if the organization is also global, then we match the organization's local footprint to our local footprint, and they partner together. Awesome. That sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Sue Lin. Yeah. yeah that, that deserves, yeah, that deserves all good. an Thank applause, you. for sure. Um, Sue Lin, you, you, at Standard Charter, Standard Charter has been a leader in many ways in the gender space. And we, we had a bit of a couple of chats about kind of some of the things you've been doing. I found them fascinating. Would you share with us a little bit about, um, you know, what you think has worked best uh, Add and with you know from Standard Chartered, sure. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for having me here today. It's a real honour to be on this panel and speaking to a topic that's very dear to my heart. Um, we have great representation from Standard Chartered today as well um, ah. across the organisation. Um, but really, I think just the premise of, of this session, you know, the workplace has a pivotal role to play with respect to economic empowerment. Um, Organisations have a huge role. Standard Chartered, you know, we believe that economic empowerment in the workplace is um, fundamental. Um, when we think about our organisation, Shelley, you spoke to it, um, we operate in 59 markets around the world. We have a huge presence in Africa, the Middle East and in Asia. Um, when we talk about our purpose, we talk about driving commerce and prosperity through our unique diversity. And diversity is very much from a gender lens as well. So when we speak to our clients, we talk about you know, our diversity, we talk about um, what we're doing from a gender perspective. It's very embedded in our conversations with our clients. Um, if I think about um, the steps that we've taken throughout our organization, I think one of the first that really resonated with me and one of the reasons why I joined the bank is that we have demonstrated female leadership at the top levels of our organization. So our board has 43% female representation, which is, which, yeah, which is great and which is unique. Um, also, 14 of the CEOs in some of our largest markets, so that's China, Hong Kong, the UAE, have female CEOs. Um, there's a commitment from our leadership team at the board level, the CEO level, um, the regional level to drive um, gender equity um, when we think about how we hire, when we think about how we promote talent. Um, the process that we go through as we go through um, hiring is extremely rigorous, so making sure that when we look at candidates, we're looking at a balanced mix of male and female. Um, when we think about promotions, um, you know, individuals are encouraged to challenge if we see an anomaly with respect to male-female representation. So there's a very active um, involvement across the organization when we think about female leadership. I think the other points to call out is just within our organization, we have councils in place, we have extremely powerful employee resource groups. So those um, employee resource groups are led by individuals which are extremely passionate and they have been able to drive and foster change. So if I think about what we've done in the Americas, um, we know that family planning is important. Um, we're not just talking about maternity leave, we talk about parental leave, we talk about fertility benefits and fertility benefits for women, also same-sex couples. And I think one of the points that I also just wanted to make is when you think about uh, an organization culture, and we were talking about this actually with the team earlier, culture is such a huge part of, you know, why one might decide to work for an organization. And I think that's, you know, the role that we have to play. Um, I'd also just like to comment on hybrid working, and I know that that is, is something that's come about because of COVID. Um, what we're finding is that, you know, some institutions are pulling that back a little bit. As Standard Chartered, we are very committed to a hybrid working model. We talk about this as a new way of working. We know that it's important. We've actually done training for our managers um, to be able to operate in a hybrid environment post-COVID and make it effective and make it a sustained change for the organization. So that's a lot there. But. Amazing. Now, how many uh, job application forms have you brought? <laughs> <laughs> she'll be. She'll. She'll take it online over here. <laughs> 
<laughs> that sounds terrific. Well, when when you think about um, you know uh, organizations that do an excellent job internally, as Standard Chartered clearly seems to be doing, um, in terms of serving and opening and, and being equitable within the workforce, they're usually also organizations that serve markets well. Um, can you can you speak to just a little bit about how the impact of that internal, all those internal, you know, not just data points, but the culture that you've developed really, um, has affected your actual business and in terms of addressing markets and pat particularly women's markets? Yep. I mean, I think I was just looking at statistics, and if you look at female leadership representation versus, you know, in Asia, for example, versus Europe and the Americas, there's a pretty big difference, and and there's a and there's a meaningful gap. I know there's a there's a pronounced gap in the U.S., but if you look at Asia, um, it's even more pronounced. And I think the point that I made just around 14 of our largest markets with female CEOs, you have the UAE there, you have China, you have Hong Kong. I mean, that's where. <laughs> when we are hosting industry events and you see someone from the top of our of our of our bank representing our bank and our footprint it really does um have an impact on our client base and also the perception of women within organizations and women in leadership positions i think without a doubt and um, I'm just curious, just to take it a step further, are, are there any specific either programs and or just, you know, within things that you've ordinarily done, not necessarily specifically done to address women's needs in the marketplace, um, where you can see the reflection of having changed the organization so much over or, or cultivated this equity in the organization, where it's had an impact on your ability to do business and attract more women, say, as c customers or women, you know, female founders or anything? Yep. Um, I think one of the points actually just I'd, I'd like to call out here is, is how we think about um, our vendors and our suppliers. And there was a remarkable statistic just around yeah, the number of women-owned businesses and less than 1% of corporate spend is actually with women-owned businesses. So that's kind of astounding. So when we go through our vendor selection process, there's a very rigorous process there around, you know, are we thinking about the leadership of the vendors that we're partnering with? Are we, you know, not just taking referrals, but also looking much more broadly around who we work with? And so that is one of the areas where I've seen us um, just have impact in our communities. So through procurements, you're saying, and, yeah. and things like that. Yeah, that can be hugely powerful. Yeah. We all know that big corporations, not just banks, but in many others, are spending millions, if not billions of dollars in the marketplace. So if that can be generated and, and directed toward women-owned businesses, that could be huge. Yeah, I, I do have a, uh, I have to, you know, full disclosure, I'm on the board of an organization called Financial Alliance for Women. Uh, and it's all about, you know, serving the financial uh, institutions uh, to help them better serve the women's market. Because that we know that women are you know, will be more uh, influenced uh, with with specific programs, and women have different needs. Whether it's because they're caretakers, because they ha have different life paths, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so yeah, I'm curious about that, Emery. You were. Yeah. So I just wanted to speak to the issue of of culture in the workplace as well as as how you do your work, and. I've now, I led an academic institution, led in government, uh, and now I've been at New America for 10 years. And my mantra is family comes first. And I really mean that. In part, if I have somebody who's working for me and they, you know, a parent is ill, a child is ill, and they say, no, I'd rather get the memo out, I really, that's not the right values as far as I'm concerned. And I also don't think they can do a good job if they stay, you know, trying to do that while somebody is, is really in trouble. Now, I expect them to be professional, and I've never been disappointed, right? They, they have to get somebody to cover for them, or they, but I've never had somebody let me down with the, with the idea, my life line is always family comes first, and when family comes first, your work does not come second. Your life will come together, uh, and I've never been disappointed. And that's true for men, too, right? I mean, particularly if we are expecting parents to co-parent, we have, you know, parental leave equally for any gender, uh, and if a man, I have a number of men who work for me who are the lead caregivers or the lead parents, and so when, you know, their children are, are when the, the school calls, they need to go as well. So I think there's, we have this idea of work versus family. It is perfectly possible to put them together alongside standards of professionalism. Mm 
Yeah, Shelley, if I could if I could jump into it and just piggyback on that. I, you know, it's funny, as I listen to you just now say that, Anne-Marie, I'm thinking about just the way I've seen the trends change over the years. When I started my career, I was I practiced law for a decade, and I remember being in the law firm, and nobody would talk about when they were going to like take care of a kid issue, and everybody would kind of keep it a secret. My Over the last 10 years, as I've navigated different corporations, KPMG, Major League Baseball, et cetera, people have been really open yeah. about the fact that family first, I mean, I love that, and men and women both being really honest about, I need to take time off, I got to catch my kid's game, yes. or it's parent-teacher meeting. So I feel like there is more of an openness around it, and people are leaning into family first, and I agree with you too. I mean, that is my mantra. It's like hashtag family first yep. all the time. It really means a lot. And ju just to uh, circle back on this, you know, McKinsey study and the statistic about women leaving, I will say for myself, when I was 34, I was chief marketing officer at Bank of America during a historic turn, what became a historic turnaround, bank was failing, biggest bank in the country. And we went from last to first in deposit gathering, number 23 to number one in consumer lending in the country in the space of 18 months on the back of seven new initiatives and also obviously pulling back in our risk picture. I had uh, a toddler at home and uh, a husband who sometimes was home, sometimes, yeah, you know, worked sometimes, but not really out of the house, he had a business. And after we turned the bank around, and we did that, like I said, it was the largest turnaround in American corporate history at the time that was not government aided, so Chrysler in the 70s had been bigger government aided. Um, my boss, Dick Rosenberg, who sadly passed away about three weeks ago, um, who became the CEO at that point, um, stepped up to CEO, and the gentleman who replaced him couldn't have been more the opposite. And one day, when I was home with my sick baby, I get a call from him, gruffly saying, Porgus, where are you? I said, well, as I told the office, you know, I mean, I don't part to him. I said, I'm at home with my child. He said, well, you better get in here by this afternoon. That's what he said to me. And that is the moment that I thought, I'm leaving this bank as soon as I can. Because, you know, the second that changed, my boss, Dick Rose, he was amazing. The second that changed. So now we have a study that proves it, you know, telling you that women are feeling empowered and they know they're empowered and we know that there are many opportunities out there. And hell, you better be good to my family. <laughs> and if you don't get that I'm home with my sick child. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so it's very personal when you when you say all these things, and I know it's personal to many of us. That and and uh, and I will add that going a step further. After I did start my first business, which you know was also you know thankfully successful, at about seven years in, I was going through my first divorce, and asked my business partner who had her, had her own prior uh, personal challenge a couple of years earlier and when she discovered that she had stage four breast cancer, but she made it through, thankfully, took off nine months. I said, I need you to step up now because I'm going through my crisis now and I need to be with kids. And when she said she didn't think she could do it, I said, okay, then we're selling the company because my kids come first. And we would always had offers to buy the company. And I said, OK, here are three people who've asked us before. They want to buy the company. I said, we're calling them this afternoon. Because if you don't feel you can step up, you know, then, then that's it for me. That's right. And we did. And you know, we did well. And both of us did well and all that. But we sold the company. And you know, I have to say, the PS to the story is not a sad one that I had to sell the company or that I chose to sell the company. The PS is amazing, not only that I got to be with my kids and give them the time they needed during that time, but also that you know went on to start a few other companies that did way better than the first company. <laughs> so so just know that you know it may seem like a crisis and something that's harmful at the time to yourself or to others, but find a way to do it constructively, and you know that that's what it, that's what it takes, and that's what women have been doing actually for a long, long time. But to your point, there is a way you can be very successful uh, and always prioritize your family. And it's often parents, right? As you get older, right? If earlier it was kids. Many of the people in my workplace have, you know, ailing parents, and they need to spend time with them. Um, so, and that's just as important. Right, 100%. So do we have, I think we have a few minutes for questions. So um, gen gentlemen up there. Oh, OK. We, we, we need to, so yeah, right up. 
Yeah. Good. Yeah, exactly. Good exercise here. Fantastic discussion. Thank you all so much. Thank um, you. We've made tremendous progress, right, since the pandemic in providing greater flexibility in helping to perpetuate this understanding that work is something to be done, not necessarily a place to be, right? And that benefited folks, women, folks with disabilities who could join labor force and participate, et cetera, et cetera. We're starting to see some of that progress, some attempts rather, and efforts dial back a little bit, largely by male leaders who are saying, I want folks, folks in the office, I want butts in seats, et cetera, et cetera. What would you say to some of those leaders who are getting ever more vocal, and dare I say aggressive, in their demands to have their folks back in the office? I'll tell you what, they're going to lose. They're going to lose the war for talent. I, I mean, actually, there, there's been some recent research done on this. and. We demand flexibility, like it's universal. And anyone who doesn't get that is gonna lose the talent. People are gonna go, and we were just talking about this earlier, the number of women who bailed from corporate America and started their own businesses during the pandemic is explosive. We were like, the hell with it, we're done, we're out. Um, and I think that trend will continue on its own, but as leaders push back and start trying to do the force back, I think we will continue to walk away in droves. Mm -hmm. Sulin, you go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think just you know when we interview um, when we interview individuals at our company, the first thing that we get asked is what is your bank's hybrid work policy, and that's at the forefront. Um, if I think about um, our graduate hiring, that's very much part of the discussion, and not being able to um, keep pace with the times is 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 going to, yeah, we're going to lose the war on talent. It's really important. And we've shown that we can work productively, if, if anything, more productively than before. Um, and it's just maintaining that. And as senior leaders, keeping keeping that dialogue going and, and demonstrating that it works. So I have, I'm on both sides of this issue. I, uh, so I believe in a deeply flexible workplace. You just heard me, family first. And when we were five days a week in the office, nobody was really five days a week in the office. We're a think tank. Fridays were very quiet, and Monday mornings were very <laughs> quiet. But in theory, um, then we could be completely flexible uh, because there was a baseline that said you're going to be in the office, so if you needed to work from home, you work from home. Then we went to, and nobody came in the office. So now... I believe in in deep flexibility, but I also believe in human connection. And I've written a lot about, you know, human nature and the need to connect as much as the need to compete. I mean, it's and I know that we rode through the pandemic on the social capital we had built through human connections. So there are teams at New America that are almost entirely remote, uh, and we have some manager discretion. But if managers say, I need people in the office, they can now, we also have a union, require people to be in the office two days a week, which seems to me a reasonable compromise. Uh, and if you have a medical leave, I mean, we've, we've got exemptions from that if you're immunocompromised, et cetera. Um, but I think this is the challenge for hybrid work. And I also want to say to many of my young people, you know, I can be with you on Zoom, but bumping into me, I, I spent my life trying to make sure the ladies' room is a place for power conversations. And, you know, it, you know, I need to be able to bump into you and have that spontaneous interaction that will help build a relationship. So I am, I hope we can settle on a hybrid that also allows for real people, you know, people in an office or in some common physical space. Let me put it that way. And, and I think that's the hard work. Like, that's right. it. I totally agree with that that's the hard work anybody who lead, leads hr or talent like these are the battles you're trying to help your your leaders navigate right now totally. spot on totally um we have only a couple more minutes so let's do one more quick question and then we'll do a rapid close here hello thank you so much ladies for all that you have shared with us my name is laura natera working from the united nations and i wanted to ask you a little bit as you talk on the workplace reasons for why people leave and also on flexibility uh, reflecting a little bit on the intersectionality of that, because we know that as there are women leaving, there's also a lot of women that don't even get the chance to enter. And when I say that, I reflect specifically, for instance, on women refugees or women that didn't have the 
precise right to work in, in one country and they're as talented, fight so much to get the scholarships, everything. So I just wanted to know from your perspective what is being done on that regard uh, to kind of secure that it's equitable. And when mean, we say equitable, it's equitable for so many, for instance, international students that when they finish, they really want to get into the private sector, they want to go to Standard Charter but they or, or any other of these organizations, but they don't even attempt because they know they cannot get um, the sponsorship for their visas. So just your thoughts on that. I'm, I'm happy to take a first stab at that. I can, I can tell you that that's part of the work that, can you guys hear me? Yeah. That's part of the work that our organization is doing right now. We're trying to help break down barriers to access. I mean, to your point, that's a huge issue, especially for the women we see who are unemployed. They don't have access. They don't know where to go for the work. And, you know, big corporates, they go, they use their recruiting firms, they post where they post. They're not looking for our women, right? So we're trying to help them find our women. We're trying to take our women to them and break down those barriers to access, but someone said it earlier, it's almost like all of all of our, our women-led think tanks um, and, and organizations and NGOs need to come together and really think about how we do this more strategically, right? So how do we work with you to do it You know, at, at our level? How do we work to get, we have to all come together to figure out how to continue to break down these barriers because it's so systemic and it's so deep-rooted, it will take hundreds of years to break it down one-on-one. -on -one. 100%. Well, I think that uh, I, I'm, we don't have time for any more questions. Unfortunately, I'm getting the high sign over here, and soon I'll get the hook. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Um, but it, let, let's do a, a lightning round. If there's one thing you would want to ask this audience to do to uh, advance equity in the workplace, what would it be? Okay. Those of you who have a male partner, one of the most important things you can do if you have children or maybe it's just some family event, ask him to organize the birthday party. Yeah. From start to finish. Don't pay any, you know, he can do it. Believe me, he can do it. It won't be like yours, but he can do it, and you just hands off. That's the kind of step we need to make if men are really going to be equal to women at, love on the home front. Love it. I love Thanks. that. I love that. I have something to talk to my husband about when I get home. <laughs> um, so I would say, in addition to what Anne-Marie said, find someone in your network at work that you don't know, that you don't engage with, that you don't support, who looks different from you, and wrap your arms around that person and help bring them along. Thank you. Susan. So uh, to close, my advice um, would be to know your value and that you're there for a reason and ask for more. Uh -huh. <laughs> Woo! All right. Let's give this, let's give everybody a Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thanks for your attention. Hopefully you got something good.